Well, happy Mother's Day. This certainly was not the um, scene we were expecting today. I had asked Mike and Lisa if it was okay for me to wear a, a, stra a sleeveless dress. <laughs> well, no problem with that today. We'll just load up with the clothes and the boots and all of that again, huh? Um, you know, Mother's Day can be a really wonderful time, and it can also be a really difficult time. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that, but a lot of times you really look forward to Mother's Day and other people just dread it. So we're going to see, oh, it's, it's up, yay. So as I said, it can be awesome. We're going to try this and we're praying that this works. <laughs> look at that, okay. Ooh, wasn't that neat? Um, if you're a new mom or you're the mom of beautiful little darling children who listen to you all the time and they're really cute, Mother's Day is wonderful. Right? You can show them off and they let you dress them because they have no say. <laughs> Life is great. Mother's Day can also be really wonderful if you have a great relationship with your mom and with your kids. Correct? But life can be difficult. Sometimes you might be the little one in the red with the sad face. Possibly your relationship with your mom is damaged. Maybe it's been bitter for a very long time. Maybe you never really had a great relationship with your mom. Maybe you live far away from mom. She's in another country or another city, or possibly she lives right down the road, and you wished she lived in another city. <laughs> Maybe your mom died. You know, Mother's Day can be really difficult the first few years, really forever. Mother's Day can be difficult if your mom has already passed on. If you've ever struggled with infertility, you know that Mother's Day can be just torturous. It's one of those days that you would rather just, they would wipe off the calendar because it just is a constant reminder that you are not the mom you dreamed you would be. If you ever placed a child for adoption, that child is not living with you. What a pain this day could bring. If you've been adopted, this is the day that you might think about where you came from, your birth family, your biological family, the circumstances that led to you being placed with a new family. If you've experienced the death of a child, what does Mother's Day bring to you? It can bring a whole lot of heartache. You might possibly be a dad, a single dad, who's raising his child or children. There's no mom in the house on Mother's Day. What do you do about that? Maybe you're a single dad who doesn't have custody of his children. As you can see, there are a whole lot of reasons that Mother's Day can be difficult. Maybe you're struggling with your spouse. You're the mom, but, but you're struggling with dad, or you're the dad and you're struggling with mom and it's a day you're supposed to be celebrating all of this, or you're the child and your parents are struggling. There's lots of other situations I'm sure that I didn't even mention here. Um, how many of you can relate to one of these or more or 10? Yeah. <clears throat> it seems there are a lot more issues that can bring about negative emotions around the holidays and yet we're bombarded with this, right? <laughs> Flowers and candy and roses and short sleeve pretty dresses that you can't wear and <laughs> then it snows, right? <laughs> So we want Mother's Day to be like this, but we live in a broken world. So that adds some difficulty in there. We also live in a world that's not always easy. We can really have a really rough year and then it leads up to Mother's Day and we build all this stuff up based on what the world tells us, the messages in the mall, on TV, on the radio, everywhere you go. It's all about flowers and candy, right? It can bring up a mix of emotions because maybe you are excited about Mother's Day, but you have some of these other negative things that have gone on as well. And it brings up a lot of memories. You can start thinking back to when you were growing up, what life was like in your home as a child. Maybe it was wonderful and you miss that. Or maybe it was really difficult and you're thankful that that's done. I'm going to share a little bit about my story. Um, first of all, Lisa and I 
have we just discovered today that we have actually taught at two of the same schools. I had a degree in music education, and I used to teach music as well. And uh, Lisa and I both taught at Peoria Elementary. I did 24 or five years ago, something like that, maybe closer to 30, I don't know. Um, Lisa's there right now. And then we also both taught at Southeast Christian School. And when Lisa was the music teacher there, I was teaching the band. That's actually how we met. So I would come in and take over her room right after school, and she was just so gracious. She'd just sit in her little desk doing her work, and we're honking away on clarinets and all of this stuff. It was wonderful, and she sat and listened to it so joyfully, because <laughs> that's just who Lisa is. But anyway, so Lisa and I reconnected through Facebook, and uh, we were having coffee one time, and Mike was around, so he came over and met, and we started talking and everything. They ended up inviting me to come and speak here. And I thought, great. Then he said, how about Mother's Day? And I thought, do you know who I am? Do you know my story? Because I'm not sure <laughs> I'm the one to be speaking on Mother's Day, which you'll find out in just a minute. By the way, Mike ran this by the elders, and they actually all looked at my website and read my story, and they still invited me. So thank you. <laughs> Mike has a sense of humor, as you all know. Well, let me tell you a little bit about my story. This is how I became a mom. Uh, it's the only thing I ever wanted growing up, was to be a mom. Um, I had other dreams too, but my biggest dream was that I wanted to be a mom. I could not wait. So when my husband Bob and I got married, um, we waited a few years and then we started trying to have kids and all of a sudden, we were realizing things weren't working the way they were supposed to and we didn't know why and everybody just kept saying, oh, relax, take a vacation. Well. Four years later, a lot of vacations and a lot of relaxation, and there was no baby. So <laughs> we ended up going to a, a doctor, and we went through some very expensive procedures, and I did end up getting pregnant once. And we hung little baby booties on the door knocker of our home and invited my parents over for dinner, and we all celebrated. And then a week later, when I went to the doctor, they couldn't find a heartbeat, and I had miscarried. So I know infertility stress and pain, and I know the pain of uh, miscarriage as well. So we discovered that our insurance rates for covering the infertility treatments were almost out, and uh, we couldn't do anything more with it. Um, I grew up in a home with an adopted brother. He was born in Vietnam, and we brought him home when, I was 14, when he was 14 months old. I was seven. So adoption to me has always been sort of a normal thing. I knew a lot of families did not really understand it. For me, my brother, that was how he came into our family. So um, before my husband and I even got married, we went to an engaged weekend, and we talked about families and how many kids we wanted and all those types of things. And we said, hey, one day, let's go to Vietnam. Let's adopt from Vietnam. Well, we never really thought about it again until this time when we were thinking about adopting. But Vietnam never entered our, our minds at that point. We, we went to an adoption agency and ended up adopting our son, Brendan. He was born, by the way, Mother's Day was the day that I got the phone call that said I was going to be a mom. So that was 23 years ago today. And uh, six weeks later, and two weeks earlier than we thought, <laughs> uh, our son Brendan was born. He's back there filming, so everybody stare at him because he loves that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> I get to do this because I'm standing up here. He'll, he'll make me pay later, but you know. Anyway, so we adopted our son Brendan. He was born on June 3rd. We were at the hospital when he was born. We were standing right outside the door. We literally heard his first cry on the other side of the door. And we didn't know what to do. We're standing there in the hallway just going, that's our baby, but what do we do? And the nurse came out and she said, his birth mom asked if you guys were here. The doctor had asked her if she wanted to hold him and she said, are his parents here? Have them come in, we want them to hold him first. So we got to hold him first. It was just an amazing thing. So as you've all heard the story, this happens all the time, our adoption was finalized, and six weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> so my daughter, Katie, is sitting right over here. And they are 15 months apart, so at times it felt like I was raising twins, except they just weren't on the same schedule. But I had a double stroller and a double nursery, and everything was just wah, wild and crazy. But life was great, because I was a mom. It was wonderful. 
And we kind of thought we were done. But when the kids were about six and seven or seven and eight, they came to us kind of ganged up on us and said that they wanted a little brother. I don't know who does that, but these kids came and said they wanted a little brother. And I said, you know, this whole baby thing doesn't really work very well with mom. And they're like, we don't want a baby, duh. We want a brother, you know, <laughs> ready to play. And so in our family, <laughs> we go find a brother. So we did. We, we started thinking back. We, went, we called the agency, the same agency we had used before. And we were talking about adopting a child that was maybe around five, because they were seven and eight. And we thought that would be a good age to play together. Wouldn't life be grand? We'll just design this whole thing the way we think it should go. And it'll be perfect, right? And so we called the agency, and they said, uh, I told them that one of the biggest concerns I had was something called attachment. I didn't really understand it very much, but I had heard that there were lots of kids that had come over from, age, from orphanages in Vietnam or in uh, Russian bloc countries where they were really struggling to bond with their new families. And I knew I didn't want that to be a problem. So I told her that that was my biggest concern. She said, is race an issue? And I said, no. And she said, oh, then you want to go to Vietnam. Well, that was what I thought earlier and I had forgotten. All of a sudden when she said that, I was like, that must be what we're supposed to do. And the reason she said that, that we should go to Vietnam is because they treat them just like family there. So we traveled to Vietnam, the four of us, and found our new little son who ended up being three and a half years old in this orphanage that I don't know any family that lives the way that these kids lived. So the reason we went was because they treat them just like family. And there were probably 40 cribs along one wall. And all of the kids were sitting on a floor with no toys. It was totally desolate. And actually, what was weird was they had a ceiling kind of like this with a TV hanging down. And they were playing Beauty and the Beast dubbed in Vietnamese. That was the weirdest thing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's where our son came from. And as we toured around, we started realizing as we went into the baby room that had about 50 cribs with like 100 babies, two in each crib, lined this way rather than lengthwise because they just didn't have room. We were thinking, this is not really what families are like, the ones that we know so far. Anyway, we brought our son home. His name was Sam. And we discovered very, very quickly that there were many, many problems that they had not shared with us. First of all, we had the language barrier, but also he had developmental delays that we, didn't, we were not aware of. Um, in fact, we had him tested for the special ed program at school when he was about four, and he tested at less than the first percentile, meaning that 99.9% .9 of the kids would score higher than him on all of these tests. And so our hearts were just broken. We realized he had really poor motor coordination. And he had a club foot that had been fixed. And he had scabies. And he had hearing loss. And he had all different kinds of problems. And I remember while we were in Vietnam, we called home because we were very concerned about it because we had a seven and an eight-year-old already. And we were thinking, are we going to be able to deal with this? And basically, we were guilted into the fact that these nuns had prayed for us and this was the child that God told them that we were to raise and he was already our son. And so we decided, you know, if, if God said this, then we're going to do it and he'll provide for us. So we brought him home. And we spent the next eight years um, driving him to therapy in Colorado Springs every single week, taking him for special ed appointments, for five surgeries, for... Uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, every um, therapy that you can imagine that's out there. And uh, it wasn't working. We tried everything we could do, and it wasn't working. And not only was it not working, but our family was falling apart. I do want to show you, I have a picture here. This was in Vietnam, and kind of a funny little thing. They told us not to talk to the soldiers while we were there because they don't like Americans. So we were in the zoo one day, and these four soldiers came up to us with their AK-47s over their shoulders, and they said, these, your children? Yes. And they said, you take picture, us, with your children? 
I'm like, get the camera. So <laughs> here they are, all with the, the communist soldiers in Vietnam. Um, so we brought him home, and like I said, eight years went by, and this was me for eight years. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. We kept thinking, we'll just fall into a groove. It'll, it'll start to work. Somehow it'll all click. But what ended up happening, instead of our kids playing together, they ended up separating and running to their rooms. And instead of this bringing our family together, my marriage was falling apart. Instead of this bringing us together, we thought we would be the family where all the friends would want to come play at our house. None of the kids wanted to come play at our house. It was constant chaos. Um, what happens with kids who have attachment issues, and our son had reactive attachment disorder, is that they, they, love to them in their early years was scary. There, it was abuse. It was neglect. They had no primary caregiver that they could attach to. It didn't, they did not learn that they were going to be secure, and they didn't learn to trust. So what they do is they learn to control everything, and I mean everything. If I would say, this is what you're going to wear today, he would go to the dirty clothes and pull out something dirty and put it on. If this was what was for dinner, he would complain and want to eat something else. It didn't matter what was on the TV. It didn't matter what we did. There was an argument over everything. And it wasn't just that. There were all kinds of behaviors that um, I've researched and since that time and found that so many kids in our country right now, kids who have been through the foster system and kids who have had a really traumatic early upbringing really, really struggle with this. So this is where our lives were at. And I was being treated by a psychiatrist. I was struggling from depression and anxiety. I didn't want to leave our home a lot of times. And at one point, I went without sleep for five months in a row. So I was at the doctor, and I'm like, I'm going to die. And he said, you're not going to die. But I felt like I was going to die. I don't know how long you can live without sleep, but it's, it's not a pretty sight. We became the family that other people were bringing meals to. And there was really nothing wrong. We were getting meals, and we had friends who cleaned my house. And it was just a crazy time. So one night I was in bed crying, which this again was what I looked like a lot of the time. And I told Bob, I said, I don't know what this means really, but I can't keep doing this. I'm going to die. I said, you're going to be a, a single dad. You're going to be raising these kids by yourself because I'm not going to make it. And I didn't have any diagnosis or anything, but I just knew I was going to die. So at that point, he said, I know. We'll figure something out. So the very next day, a friend of mine owned a consignment store. And I, we were walking into her store. Three years earlier, she had asked us if we would go to dinner with her and her husband because they were interested in adoption. And they knew that we had adopted twice and that we were really struggling with our youngest son. And so they said, could you take us to dinner and don't give us all the fluff? <laughs> We're like, OK, I'm good at that. I'm good at not giving you fluff. So we went out to dinner with them and told them really what was going on. And we said, you know, if you're going to adopt, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But deal with every issue you've got in your life. <laughs> deal with every grief you've never solved. Deal with anything going on in your marriage. <laughs> you've got to get into a counselor and let them dig around a little, because if you don't, that child will. So go in and deal with your stuff before you adopt. Well, she ended up getting pregnant with twins, so they didn't adopt. But I walked into her store that day. This is three years later now. And at this time, they had a nine-year-old, a four-year-old, and twin one-and-a-half-year-old boys. So I walked into her store, and she said, hey, guess what? I said, what? She said, we're getting ready to adopt. And I said, you are? Are you going to get your little girl? Because that was what she always said. She said, nope, God's made it clear. It's a boy, he's local, and he's older. And I looked at my husband, and I kind of started to cry. And she said, you got one you want to wrap up? And then I cried even more. And I remember thinking, this is not what I was talking about. I just wanted some help. I don't want him to move into a new family. I just want some help. And we had looked everywhere. I had looked all over the US. We had been to therapists and, and help all over the place. 
So over the next few weeks, he began staying at their house on the weekends to kind of give us a break and let my PTSD sort of calm down because I was really triggered from the trauma that had been going on in our home. And while he was staying with them, my friend heard him and her son talking several different times. And one night in particular, they were lying in bed in their bunk beds and getting ready to go to sleep. And they were talking about, wouldn't it be great if we were brothers? When do you think you could move in? And so this was happening gradually over several weeks. And we kept thinking, what is going on? It's like we're just sitting here watching him move into their family. And what started to happen was he would go over there on the weekends and then when he would come back, his anxiety would just spike through the roof and his behaviors were 10 times worse than they were before, but he was doing great over there. And we're thinking, what in the world? I'm his mom. Why is he not able to make it here? Well, he ended up moving into their home. And about six weeks later, it was Easter. And I remember walking around pacing the floor in my kitchen. And it was cold. He had been gone about four or six weeks. And I was just walking around talking to God out loud. <laughs> and I was saying things like, you took us all the way to Vietnam to get this little boy and bring him home to be in our family. And I know you wanted him healed. And I prayed for healing. But we wanted you to heal him in our family. What are you doing? This isn't what we wanted. This isn't what we asked for. And then I said the doozy. I said, are you really asking me to give up my son? And I turned around and I looked at the table where all the Easter baskets were sitting so nicely with the little chocolate in them. And I remembered what Easter was all about. And what I did next was I braced myself like this. Because I had heard through lots of well-meaning Bible study teachers that if you didn't do what God wanted, he would have to get your attention. Like he would use frying pan wisdom, or he'd crack you over the head with a two by four, or you'd get struck by lightning or something. That was what I was, I, and I literally, I was scared. I was shaken in my kitchen that day, and I'm sitting here like this. I'm so sorry. And you know what? This is the part that really got me, was deep inside. I felt I heard God say, it really hurts, doesn't it? And so rather than cracking me over the head, he scooped me right up and said, I get it. I lost my son too. He related to me right where I was at, right in my pain. He didn't condemn me. He related to me. I didn't need a crack over the head. I was already listening and paying attention. I had been praying for help for years. He was now offering it, and rather than striking me down, he scooped me right on up. And that was the day my healing began. I want to share some scripture with you that has really helped me through the years. The first one is Isaiah 24, 42, 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. He's not going to strike you over the head with a lightning bolt. He's going to scoop you up. And I don't know why we have to go to that place of scaring people into obedience. Because um, that's not what God does. This one's a big one, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> um, what I think is so cool, this is um, Isaiah 61, 1. I'm going to read to you from Luke 4. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Just real quick, it was his turn to speak. He was the one to read the lesson that day. The one that he happened to read was this one. It says, he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. So here we're now quoting what Jesus was reading that day. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Me. <laughs> to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. My family that had been devastated. Strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance, and so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns, adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. And he didn't read the, Jesus didn't read the entire passage there. He stopped after four verses, but it says, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus stood up and read the scripture saying, I came to bind up the brokenhearted. I came to free the prisoners. And then he put it away and said, by the way, this is me. I'm God. I just think that's really, really cool. Um, I wrote a book about our experiences. It's called Relinquished, When Love Means Letting Go. Lisa has one over there. <laughs> and um, it's, a, it's just the story of what happened in our family and how we worked through it. And whenever somebody asks me to sign a copy, I always write this scripture. It's Joel 2.25 that says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. To me, that is a promise. I believe God told me that. I believe that he has said that to me many, many times when I have been broken and crying and feeling like nothing's going to change and it's never going to get any better. And I just feel like he has constantly said, remind me, I'm going to do this. And so I go to him and I say, you told me, you promised, I am not letting you off on this. I'm remembering, but you told me, so I'm holding you to it. And I continue that to this day. And he is healing our family. We're, we've not had our son with us for six years. And he is continuing to heal. And he will continue to heal you. So ask him and then hold him to it. Because he promised. Once he heals you, or even in the midst of your healing, this is what's happened to me. He's made this verse come alive for me. It says, Praise to be, be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the same comfort we ourselves receive from God. Once he comforts you, then you know how to comfort others. So that's where we're at today. And I'm hoping and praying that this is where, what you can take away too. He can comfort you wherever you're at on this Mother's Day. If you're having a wonderful day, yahoo. <laughs> Go out and celebrate. Buy some flowers that you can't plant till later this week. But buy them, take them home, cut, brush the snow off, and enjoy them. Have a wonderful day. And if you're having a difficult day, know that he will comfort you. 
and he will heal you. And through that, you'll then be able to heal and help somebody else in their comfort when they need it. Um, I do have some copies of my book, if anybody is interested. Um, we'll have them back here. And I just want to let you know, I have, like Mike was saying, I do run a ministry, and I do some life coaching. I've got a degree in marriage and family, counsel, marriage and family therapy. And I also do some retreats for people who are really hurting. I just did one last week for eight moms who flew in from all over the country who have gone through what we did with our son. And they've all lost their moms, or their sons, or daughters. Some of them lost up to three kids in sibling groups. Really, really tough situations, and today is really difficult for them. But, you know, when you gather together and you find other people who are going through something similar, it can make your own pain just a little bit less. So that's something I'd like to help with as well. I write a blog, my son and I do some podcasts, and we're just getting ready to produce a couple of documentary films on ad adoption and attachment and things like that. So if you're interested, please come on back and um, just sign up for my website, and I will uh, make sure that you get our blog and all of those different things so that you're aware when things come up. But thank you so much for having me today. I so appreciate it, and happy Mother's Day to all of you.